there was a spirit throughout the department that we're on not just a job, but a crusade. We're bringing wildlife and forests back to Missouri. We were committed to this conservation mission and cause, and we love working for it. And I saw that in people who worked in the print shop just as surely as I did in the conservation agents. I love that. Nationwide, the Conservation Department of Missouri is looked up to because we have led the way for so long, and we've done a good job uh, of delivery of what we promised. And that goes a long way with, with keeping the public with you. I think somebody said the first issue of The Conservationist was a grand experiment. Well, we've been doing a grand experiment ever since. Use them wisely. Conservation is all about using things in a smart way. So we asked them for today. I always told employees that uh, uh, I should never hear them saying that we're the best conservation department in the world. Uh, that's for others to say, and that our job is to implement the programs and to, uh, if you will, uh, provide the evidence for other people to make that observation. Evidence for this exceptional success can be seen throughout the state of Missouri. Fish and wildlife abound. For the hunter or fisherman, Missouri is simply a sportsman's paradise. Ozark rivers run clear and pure. Native grasslands flourish. And our great rivers, the Mississippi and the Missouri, bracket the state with awe-inspiring wonder. Outdoor recreation is everywhere, easily accessible to every Missourian. In our schools and cities, innovative programs ensure that the benefits of wild things and wild places will continue to be experienced for generations to come. Missouri is one place that has gotten conservation right. And this success is the envy of the nation and the world. How did we get here? What makes the conservation movement in Missouri so special? Can a look at the beginnings of this journey shed light on the road ahead? It's best to ask someone who was there. In 1935, 17-year-old Bill Crawford attended a pivotal meeting in Columbia, Missouri. I was a World War I baby, August the 30th, 1918. I was an only child in the family, a boy, and I, I hunted and fished with my dad. Everything he did, I did, and everywhere I went, he went. So, so he said to me, he says, I got to go down to Columbia today. They're having a meeting about this conservation stuff. And I said, well, uh, he said, would you like to go? I, it's just uh, 17 years old. And so I said, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go with you. Uh, uh, it was natural for me to go. The Conservation Commission has asked you to come here to help us in the reasonable regulation of the bird, fish, game, forestry, wildflower, and wildlife resources of this state. The people were really upset in Missouri. We'd been through a tremendous drought period, the biggest drought we've ever had in Missouri in the 30s, the Dust Bowl days. People were worried about fires on the landscape, forestry-wise. You couldn't hardly find a raccoon in the state. They, the game situations had gone to pot. Everything was just really, really at a low level. And they were just, they wanted, they wanted an administration of these kind of things taken care of somewhere. Now, the farmers, the people that hunted and fished, and all the people that were concerned with these resources, and the foresters and so forth, they just weren't getting any house from the politicians. So that's what happened here on September the, the 20th, 1935, that day. That was a, a gathering unlike any other before at anywhere at any time. And so that night, the Restoration and Conservation Federation of Missouri was organized. A leader that emerged that night in the conservation movement was E. Sidney Stevens.
And he said, you know, what I propose is the hard path. Uh, write a constitutional amendment exactly as we would have this address. Educate our people about the importance of that, get them to vote for it uh, through the initiative petition. They had the foresight to know that if they wanted to really put something in that would endure, they needed to change the constitution of the state. And they did that by creating a constitutional amendment that changed the way that the Department of Conservation was set up, where our governor would appoint a uh, conservation commission composed of four citizen commissioners, citizen commissioners, and they set it up in a non-political fashion so that we would have two Republicans and two Democrats, so we would take the politics out of our decisions, and that's exactly the way it works. As we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Missouri Department of Conservation, it's exciting to look back at the vision of those early founders back in 1937. And significantly, this unique organization was created by popular vote, is managed by its citizens, and continues to enjoy the overwhelming support of the people of Missouri. Nothing important happens in Missouri unless Missouri's citizens want it to happen and care enough to help to make it happen. Uh, that's been a, a signal part of, of the uh, character of Missouri conservation for uh, the last hundred years. With fish and wildlife resources at low ebb, pioneering biologists rolled up their sleeves and went to work. Their mission was clear to bring fish and wildlife back to Missouri. When we first started to work, the deer, there wasn't a deer season, and deer had to be transported and introduced into new areas. And you take turkeys, there was no hunting of turkeys. Each of us was given a project to work on, and we feel that we, we did see a lot of progress in a lot of species, so I'm, I'm real proud of that. Working hand in hand with the newly formed Wildlife Research Unit at the University of Missouri, they were inventing a brand new science, a brand new discipline, wildlife management. The commission is working with the State University and with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service in searching out the scientific basis for wildlife restoration. Technicians spend long hours in the laboratories and their specimens teach them much of the essential knowledge of the needs of wildlife in the state. Wild turkey was on the verge of being wiped out in the central United States in the 1930s. We had only about 2,500, 2,000 to 2,500 left in Missouri in the most remote Ozark counties. And we have over 500,000 wild turkeys in this state right now. Best wild turkey hunting in the world. The promise was fulfilled. So when you consider that there were only 2,000 deer in the entire state of Missouri in 1937, our deer population was restored to a level where where we now support annual deer harvests totaling 300,000 deer per year taken by archery and gun hunters. That We have over 500,000 deer hunters in our state. Uh, an economic activity of $1.1 billion per year in economic activity generated from deer hunting alone, along with the support of some 12,000 jobs uh, in, the, in the case of deer, absolutely that promise has been fulfilled. The promise of wildlife restoration continues. In the spring of 2011, 34 elk were released at the Peck Ranch Conservation Area in Shannon County. Elk, formerly abundant in the state, had not been seen in Missouri since 1865. The Missouri Department of Conservation has embarked on a modest restoration effort 
confined to a 346 square mile elk restoration zone in parts of Shannon, Carter, and Reynolds counties. Again, the promise of wildlife restoration endures. When the department was formed in the 1930s, there was a serious problem standing in the way of fish and wildlife restoration, wildfires. For decades, local residents had torched the spring woods, greening up the open range and cleaning out the ticks and chiggers. The effects of these constant fires were devastating on Missouri's overharvested and overgrazed woodlands. Burned off hillsides eroded. The clear Ozark streams were choked with gravel and mud. Leo Dry saw it firsthand. My objective was to get hold of uh, this wild land and show that it could be managed along conservation lines and not without going broke in the process, selectively cutting it instead of clear cutting it. Dry eventually became the largest private landowner in the state of Missouri. His pioneer forest encompasses over 160,000 acres along the current and Jack's Fork rivers, all managed sustainably and all preserved for future generations. And he credits the early efforts of the conservation department with his success. Well, it was all because of the way the uh, conservation department began to get fires under control that you could afford to uh, buy land and manage it for the timber and let it grow to maturity. And all you had to do was uh, cooperate with the conservation department and their fire protection program and help them put out fires in the spring. The department's attempts to control wildfires went far beyond young men carrying axes and shovels. In a major public relations effort, the Missouri Department of Conservation took to the airwaves. The foresters new tools were now guitars and microphones. Growling and a growling and a sniff of the air. Well, he can find a fire before it starts to flame. That's why they call him Smokey. That was how he got his name. Hi there, friends and neighbors. This is Joe Slattery speaking for your Missouri Conservation Commission, inviting you to spend the next quarter hour with Smokey Bear's best friend, Woody the Singing Forester, and those stars of Jubilee USA and well-known song stylists, the Tall Timber Trio. The show is brought to you through the courtesy of the Forestry Division of your Missouri Conservation Commission in the interest of forest fire prevention. And now here's the troubadour of Missouri's woodlands and the man with words of wisdom, the star of our show, Woody. That's why they call him Smokey. That was how he got his name. Thank you once again, Mr. Slattery, and howdy, everybody. Say, we got a studio full here in Studio One today, haven't we? <laughs> but right now, B.D. Haworth and a little bit of Sugarfoot Ride. Education was the key to stopping the uncontrolled burning of the Ozarks. And the department's outreach efforts didn't stop with Bledsoe's radio programs. Outfitting an old panel truck with a generator and a 16 millimeter film projector, the showboat took to the back roads of Missouri. Sharing the message of fire prevention and forest management in small towns and villages across the Ozarks, places without theaters, often without electricity. These open air cinemas were a real eye opener in the rural Ozarks. Many individuals' first experience with film was via the showboat and the Missouri Department of Conservation. I don't claim to be an expert in the field of entertainment. I just like to sing. In fact, uh, singing is really a hobby because my real business is forest fire prevention. And you know something? I think forest fire prevention should be everybody's business. For every one of us, whether we live in the big city, small town, or in woods and forest areas, can and should help to keep uncontrolled fires from the woods. So neighbors, it truly does make sense to be careful with fire and keep Missouri green and growing. <laughs>
Well, let's liven the show up. What do you say? Yeah. Here they come. Oh, yeah. All right, this take right off. Fine. Thank you. With the wildfires under control and modern management techniques brought to bear, the state's woodlands flourished. Today, Missouri timber represents billions of dollars a year in an industry supporting tens of thousands of jobs. Witness to this remarkable transformation was barrel maker Leroy McGinnis of Cuba, Missouri. We have about 55 or 60 loggers at Hollis White Oak. Uh, white oak keeps growing very, very strong, and with proper cutting, it's always a totally renewable resource. Our sales run around 16 million a year right now. We try to increase that about a million a year and increase our inventories about a million a year. Right now we have a little burn $10 million worth of inventory. 90% of that money is spent locally around through the Missouri area. We have over 100 employees. Uh, like my wife says, she's the only one getting minimum wage here. <laughs> Kindly, boys, for dropping by. Thank you, Woody. We've appreciated having you. The Ozarks, I guess, look good at any time of the year. But they looked particularly good to me that spring day I came back. It was a 20-year look I was giving them. That's how long I'd been gone. Going home. That's the song the tires were humming. When the department was first formed in 1937, there were 13 employees in the fisheries division, and all of them were in hatcheries. And the fisheries division chief was a dentist <laughs> who had come through with the old regime. So the early program was all about stocking fish, and before the department was formed in the old fish and game department, they would stock primarily anything. Basically, it was politically motivated or a friend's pond or lake or something like that. And the new commission said that they didn't want to do that, that we'd stock only public waters. Change was coming to Missouri's waters as well. Hatcheries were innovating new management techniques. Fish were becoming available for stocking in large numbers. And new delivery techniques were developed for their safe transport and survival. Creel counts, surveys of fish population and distribution, were being made across the state. The creation of farm ponds became a particularly successful program. Originally designed to provide water for upland game, the program quickly evolved into the construction and stocking of ponds for recreational fishing. The early leadership in the Department of Conservation realized that we cannot do what needs to be done alone, and so we need to engage others. And at that time, it was primarily farmers and landowners. So there was an early effort to engage the landowners in, in activities, and that was one way to get them involved. Hello there, Sonny. Looks like you're having pretty good luck. Ought to be some more nice ones in there just like that too, aren't they? Sure, plenty of them. Larger than this. We catch some nice fish in there since we did that planting. And that pond just about saved this field out here. Well, that's fine. The fishing in Missouri is considered some of the finest in the country, with abundant lakes, ponds, and world-class float fishing streams. The state has become a preferred destination for dedicated anglers, and that is an important economic boost for Missouri. So many of Missouri's outdoor adventures, um, hunting, fishing, um, bird watching, kayaking, uh, enjoying our wonderful nature uh, opportunities provide a multi-million dollar economic benefit to the state of Missouri. The outdoor activities that Missouri provide um, enhance all of the tourism assets that we offer. Many retail businesses, such as Bass Pro, partner with the Department of Conservation and with us in tourism to bring people in to enjoy conservation and nature across the state. At the Springfield location alone here in Missouri will draw four million people this year. We'll draw from about a four state area and you can see that by the license plate in our parking lot from all the different states across uh, uh, the Midwest here and you know we'll draw them in from uh, other countries too. There is a lot of interest in the outdoors. 
Exceptional organizations are not drawn from thin air. They are created and nurtured by exceptional people. And the Missouri Department of Conservation has always been home to some amazing personalities. I don't think people today can really fathom the commitment, the dedication, and the hard work that those people put forth. And it, it was hard, but so rewarding. Uh, so rewarding when you, uh, you felt like that you gained the respect of a landowner, a conservation friend or supporter out here because of what you did. Those are real satisfying experiences. You go into other state agencies and, and people are doing a job. You go into the conservation department and see the people and they're working at a cause. Into this mix of extraordinary inspiration, drive and hard work stepped Carl Noren. A biologist with the department since the 1940s, Noren took over as director in 1967. Until the design for conservation, it was emphasis was on hunting and fishing. And with the design, emphasis became the relation of animals to their environment. And that was a big step forward. I credited Carl Noren. There were other people that had input, but he was the man who came up with a basic idea. Noren foresaw a coming problem for conservation, and he also had a vision for a possible solution. It was a big idea, one that ultimately changed the very nature of how conservation was perceived. The design for conservation addressed this challenge. As the population of Missouri increased rapidly, the revenue from fish and game licenses could not keep up. There was increased demand for conservation services from this expanding population. And much of that demand did not involve traditional hunting or fishing. In 1976, an amendment to Missouri's constitution was placed on the ballot through the initiative petition. Voters were asked to decide on a one-eighth of one percent sales tax devoted exclusively to conservation. In 1976, they envisioned this design for conservation. Consequently, they were able to set aside an eighth of one percent of our sales tax to go to conservation in this state. That's a very small amount, but it adds up over the years and provides the kind of funding that is necessary if you want to put the things on the ground that you think are going to work and implement that science-based approach to uh, wildlife conservation and management. The results of the design for conservation were immediate and profound, the legacy of which can still be seen today. Land was acquired, nature centers built, hunter education was expanded. Programs were developed to improve habitat for all species. Crucial to the promise of the Design for Conservation program, the department made a concerted effort to bring conservation into the cities. The benefits and the costs of conservation were now being fairly shared by every Missourian. In the very beginning, 1937, as early as that, they had different sections in the department that dealt with education, that dealt with information. And that continued throughout and, and just got even better once Design for Conservation was put into place. So we have a, a lot of programs that have developed, but they really were based on the ideas of a few people long, long ago. We'll teach you some things about the watershed and how important it is to have a healthy watershed. Though the department made a significant urban outreach effort in the 1970s and 1980s, it has never forgotten its rural roots. Hunters and fishermen were integral to the creation of the department in the 1930s, and they continue to represent the department's core values. It's going to be nice being in flooded corn late season. Hunting is basically a, it's a privilege that we have. You're getting out there and you're being a part of nature. When you see ducks and geese flying around or any kind of bird, it's exciting. Look at that. These two are joining the Those two. Oh, here they go. This is it. This is final poach here. <laughs> nice shot. <laughs> Nice shot. 
Missouri seems to be one of those states that's really starting to be that location that the birds are coming through. A lot of these public hunting areas that we have now are really doing their job to hold a lot of birds while they're migrating. I see a bright future for ducks. Looks clean. In 1999, the private lands section was established, like specifically to work with rural landowners. Conservation on a landscape scale cannot be accomplished alone, and it cannot be accomplished solely on limited department lands. The initiative to restore native habitat for prairie chickens and other grassland species is a case in point. One of the hallmarks of our efforts is gonna be work with private landowners. We're going to find new and innovative ways to try to work with our neighbors, things that meet the economic needs of farmers and landowners, but which provide a little more habitat for the grassland wildlife that shares the landscape. In our state, all of the people own conservation. They have a stake in what happens here. It's a partnership between all of us, and we all benefit from the rewards of it. The experiment that started in Columbia's Tiger Hotel in 1935 continues today. 75 years since its founding, the Missouri Department of Conservation is strong, streamlined, and eager to address the challenges of the future. Today, Missouri is known for world-class outdoor opportunities, and this is not by accident. Citizens in the state of Missouri have a passion for the out of doors uh, like no other state across the nation. They took it upon themselves, they implemented steps that today place us as a national leader. I would encourage citizens to pause as we celebrate 75 years of conservation in the state and just reflect back, uh, recognize the success of conservation. It's easy to see. experiment has proved to be an overwhelming success. The promise of conservation for all Missourians continues.